The mingling of traditional and emerging security challenges demands fresh thinking from a new generation of scholars and practitioners. And today's guest tells us that some of those new thinkers and new soldiers won't look like their predecessors. She's Jacqueline Schneider, this week on Story in the Public Square. And welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter, the stories that shape the way we talk about public issues in the United States. To do that, we sit down each week with storytellers and scholars to talk about them and learn from their insights. Joining us this week is Jacqueline Schneider, an assistant professor at the U.S. Naval War College, an expert on many things. But Jackie, out of the gate, we need to acknowledge that you speak for yourself. You don't speak for the U.S. Naval War College, and you don't speak for the United States Navy or the Department of Defense. Did I cover the waterfront there? I covered the waterfront. Okay. So uh, among the things that you do uh, at the Naval War College is that you, uh, you're a war gamer. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, you know, apart from the, the Matthew Broderick movie from the 1980s, <laughs> I don't think a lot of people necessarily know what that means. Uh, so what, what are war games and what are they used for? Yeah, so war games, um, they really were in vogue during the nuclear world. And so anybody who's read Schelling, which is the um, quintessential theories of deterrence and coercion, um, these theories were based in a lot of the war gaming that we were doing during the beginning of the nuclear revolution. And so um, particularly the Department of Defense, but generally the national security community would get together um, and war game hypothetical scenarios in order to maximize our deterrence capabilities, to maximize our arsenal, because in general you can't exercise a nuclear crisis. I mean, you really don't want to exercise a nuclear <laughs> crisis. And so war gaming provides us opportunities to look at the hypothetical. Um, and a lot of other methodologies, you have to look to history and look to the past to gain uh, generalizable patterns or insights, but wargaming allows us to look at a hypothetical in the future, and it allows us to do it kind of with a behavioral tint. So um, wargaming is all about human interaction, all about decision making. And so in some ways, it's, it's kind of a quasi-experimental way to look at how human beings behave in different kind of um, hypothetical scenarios that have different levels of uncertainty. And so you recently conducted a, a, a game uh, about the about U.S. critical infrastructure, right? Um, tell us what you can about the, what you learned from from that game. Yeah. So. The, you know, I do a lot of work about the role that cyber operations and cyber attacks could play in international dynamics. But unfortunately, we, and maybe fortunately, we don't have a lot of past empirical examples of large-scale cyber campaigns that cause kind of physical effects, these cyber Armageddon's or the cyber Pearl Harbors that we hear about um, in a lot of the congressional testimony dating back into kind of the mid-2000s. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the largest vulnerabilities um, for the United States in any digitized or modern um, nation state is critical infrastructure, which is the civilian backbone of a, a nation state. So the power grid. Yeah. I mean, for the U.S., we actually have 17 critical infrastructure sectors, which is maybe an issue in itself. But it includes electric. It also includes the defense industrial base, finance, health care, water, transportation. Uh, it starts covering kind of almost everything. Um, so we were really interested in finding out um, What's the hurt point at which these individuals within these leading critical infrastructure sectors are interested in calling in the Department of Defense? Um, there's a lot of movement right now about how the United States should allocate its resources to defending, protecting, and deterring attacks against the critical infrastructure sectors. But that's a really difficult relationship in the United States because almost all of the critical infrastructure is privatized. 
So we had a game that we got um, CEOs, COOs, CIOs, CSOs um, from the critical 14 of the 16 critical infrastructure sectors. We also had representatives from the NYPD, the New York uh, Firefighting uh, Firefighter Department, uh, the governor's office. So Mike Steinmetz came um, here in Rhode Island, um, as well as some of the Rhode Island legislative. Um, uh, representatives, not the reps themselves, but their aides. And so we we then invited the federal government in as well, and we played a game that had a total of, I think, um, 86 attacks over two days. And we dialed up the hurt um, in kind of a randomized way because we wanted to view this as kind of an experiment. Um, and so we dialed up the hurt all the way to nuclear, to trying to see what's the point, where they, they say, DOD, Government, you've got it. Um, and it was really, really quite high. So that was very interesting. When you say DOD, you've got it, you mean when, is, when does a cyber attack elicit a kinetic response to the military yeah. troops and planes and bombers and things like that? that well, that's actually, the kind even of response beyond you're looking that. For? So um, part of one of the largest debates about the role of the Department of Defense is whether the Department of Defense should be utilized in kind of um, cyber sandbagging. So you know the National Guard is involved in large-scale event response with on, within the homeland United States. So we were trying to see, well, is there a point where these companies would read out, reach out to the Department of Defense and say, I need your help rebuilding my network. Um, I need your help in intelligence. I need your help um, in, in making sure that I can function again. And then we were also interested and I need your help because I want you to retaliate, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of the deterrence piece. And did they? Oh, it was really high. <laughs> and only uh, energy and nuclear, only attacks on energy and nuclear asked, um, ended up leading to requests for retaliation and Department of Defense support. Mm -hmm. um, almost everything <clears throat> else to include large scale attacks with um, physical deaths did not elicit a response to the Department of Defense. Um, there was a response, the, the primary response was actually for emergency management. So we found that the state played a much larger role than we ever anticipated, um, which is interesting because in general, um, the states are kind of underfunded when it comes to responses in big cyber um, campaigns or cyber threats. And we often overlook it from the federal government side, but our game really revealed how important those people are. So a lot of your work at the Naval War College is what we would in the mainstream media call out-of-the-box thinking and it makes some people uncomfortable and it's not traditional thinking. So that's a setup to what we're going to get into later. Give us a little bit of your background, how you came, and because you have a background that allows you to speak with great authority even in these out-of-the-box kinds of thinking. I hope Quickly. so. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I would say it does. So, uh, thank you. Briefly on your background, um, both where you're from and educationally, and you're an Air, Air Force veteran. Yes. So I'm from Texas, born and raised in San Antonio, which is a great city. Um, and I, when I was 18, I applied to a bunch of Ivy League schools, got into Columbia, I was really excited. My parents said, that's great, find a way to pay for it. Hmm. So I got an ROTC scholarship, which... Um, an ROTC scholarship is one of the few scholarships that will pay for an entire Ivy League education and give you a stipend. So I went to New York and I signed my contract with the Air Force ROTC on September 10th, 2001. And then September 11th, I was wow. in New York City. So it was a whole new world. Um, so I got, um, I did four years at Columbia. I have a BA in economics and political science from Columbia. I then went and did six years active duty in the Air Force all over Northeast Asia, so South Korea and Japan. Um, and then after that, I went, um, I started a PhD program at Arizona State University. My husband was stationed at Luke Air Force Base. Um, and then after two years, my husband said, where do you wanna go? And I said, I want to go to DC and I had just worked with um, Steve Biddle and been reading some things by Charlie Glazer at George Washington um, and so I transferred to George Washington, finished my PhD there uh, and then moved here um, after you know four more years um, to the Naval War College. So you were in South Korea when North Korea tested its first nuclear weapon. Is it that was, which is like my biggest mistake. <laughs> yeah, talk about that. Because you had just written a paper, yes. a memo. Yeah. Talk about that. So in undergrad, I had some really fantastic professors at Columbia. And I have to give a shout out to Tanisha Fazal, who is, um, she doesn't probably know this, but she set me on the track I'm on today. And she had a national security course where we actually simulated the six-party talks. 
And if I remember right, I think she maybe she brought in some ambassadors. And the Six Party talks were the talks between North Korea, South Korea, regional partners, including the United States, yes. China, Japan, yes. about how do you de escalate tensions on North yes. Korea, uh, on the Korean Peninsula around nuclear issues. And this was in 2000, that class I think it was in 2003 or 4. So North Korea was not officially a nuclear state. Like they had some kind of semi-civilian nuclear stuff happening, but they didn't have a nuclear weapon. They hadn't tested a nuclear weapon. So then I was sitting watch um, in South Korea um, and I wrote this fantastic memo, and the memo said, <laughs> look, North Korea is not going to test a nuclear weapon, their relationship with China means too much to them, and China is exerting pressure, it, it doesn't behoove the region for North Korea to go nuclear, very destabilizing. Don't worry, everybody. This is just them flexing their muscles. China will solve the problem. You know, I hit send, you know, clocked out, locked out, fares later. The nuke, <laughs> the nuclear <laughs> test. <laughs> and I was like, "Oh my God, can I just like bring that email back?" Too you know? late. <laughs> but, but there was, a, but there was a learning experience for yeah. you for, there, right? Yes, it was. It was really influential for me because that was the moment I realized, um, that good theories and good hypotheses aren't enough. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I started really being interested in kind of how we can um, be more rigorous in, in how we analyze these different events that are happening in national security. So fast forward to the present. You had published in War on the Rocks, which is a defense journal, uh, an essay, a piece called Blue Hair in the Gray Zone. And that was one of these out-of-the-box thinking experiences that made a lot of people uncomfortable. Talk about that. What was it? Why did some people get uncomfortable? And why did some people support it? Yeah, um, the blue hair in the gray zone is a reaction to really an, an area in the Naval War College called the Future Forces Gallery. And I would walk through it every day and it had all these unmanned systems in it and it made me really frustrated because I thought, that's not the future. I mean, yeah, maybe that's part of the future, but the future are the human beings that are manning, operating, training on these systems. And I've been doing increasingly um, uh, more work in artificial understanding artificial intelligence and the implications and cybersecurity. And the thing is that what makes one state better at artificial intelligence or cybersecurity is not a piece of hardware. It's not a machine. It, it's the human beings. And there's these huge talent races that are occurring in Silicon Valley, and now we're increasingly see it in this competition with China. And I felt like, we're not talking about the future force. This gallery has future machines in it. Where's the future force? Who are the people that are going to be manning our military in the future? Um, and I had just come off a conference where um, a high-ranking uh, Navy officer had said, we're going to be really creative about getting these cyber people in, but they can't have blue hair. And everyone laughed and said, oh, that's crazy. And I thought, why? So that piece was trying to look at the role that military culture plays in kind of impeding our thoughts about the force of the future. But, but the point is, if you have blue hair and you have this incredible young mind and you can actually contribute something to the military, why would you say no to that person? Was that not essentially what you were saying? That was exactly what I was saying. <laughs> okay. um, and I also had made an argument that physical fitness maybe wasn't as big a deal in this new form of warfare that was much more technological, which, by the way, um, Secretary Mattis seems to not agree with at all because a few weeks after my piece came out, um, they put out a new policy about um, being deployable and deployment ready. And there, if somebody isn't deployment ready in a year time span, they will immediately start procedures to kick that person out. So it looks like they're actually going the other way. No, from, but you began yeah. a conversation though, right? I, mean, I did. I mean, I've, I've begun the conversation. People were very interested. Um, it's gotten a lot of attention, good and bad, but it has started a conversation, um, including follow-on pieces that look at uh, how do we um, get military specialties that align with the new technologies that are coming out? Um, where do these technologies sit in warfare? Um, so these debate debate is happening. We have to take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. This program is broadcast three times every weekend on Sirius XM Satellite Radio's popular Politics of the United States. That's the POTUS channel, number 124. We produce Story in the Public Square with an incredibly talented crew at Rhode Island PBS in Providence, Rhode Island. We're lucky to work with them. I'm Jim Lutis, Executive Director of the Pell Center at Salve Regina University in historic Newport, Rhode Island. If you want to connect with me on Twitter, I'm at J.M. Lutis. To my right is my co-host, G. Wayne Miller, the author of 17 books, an award-winning journalist with the Providence Journal. He's on Twitter, too, 
at G. Wayne Miller, all one word. And our guest this week is a veteran of the U.S. Air Force who now teaches at the U.S. Naval War College. Jacqueline Schneider, Schneider is on Twitter too, at Jackie G. S. C. H. N. E. I. D. Jackie G. Schneid. Jackie, so you said something that triggered something in my in my memory banks. I remember a former commandant of the of the Marine Corps, uh, Charles Krulak, uh, used to say that we don't seek to man our equipment; we seek to equip our Marines. Uh, and it's, it was about, he was reflecting mm -hmm. on this relationship yeah. between technology and the individual warfighter and the future of conflict. As you walk through that, fu that, that gallery of, of, of future warfare uh, at the U.S. Naval War College, I'm wondering if you think Krulak was onto something. What, what is the role of people in the future of conflict? Is it all machines? Is it machine fighting machine? Or is there something more human at the core of, 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 of warfare? Yeah. I, I study a lot about the um, proliferation of unmanned systems. And what I've noticed, um, I do this work with a co-author, Dr. Julia McDonald at University of Denver, and um, there's a vocabulary about unmanned systems. The future, the imperative, and there's this sense of inevitability. Um, but when we looked historically, this is not necessarily true. So in wars of coercion, which are small-scale war, well, wars for very specific limited objectives, there is the possibility to maintain that with just machines. Mm -hmm. But as soon as it comes down to existential conflict, where we're talking about territorial boundaries or identities or the future of states themselves, the human being comes back. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, we have to think about where that human being really is going to reside. Unless we just want to um, opt into wars of coercion, which I think the United States would prefer in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. You, you specialize in, among other things, uh, psychology, how the human mind interacts in, in with technology and with other people. Hearing that brings to mind the image of a drone pilot who is based in a, an Air Force base in Nevada who has the power to kill. Yeah. How is that different from, you know, the old-fashioned Marine or Army person or Navy person carrying a weapon or even flying a plane. It's a, it's a very oh, different experience yeah. because there you are in your air-conditioned yeah. office, in front of screens, controlling life and death, essentially, correct? Yeah, this is fascinating and something that um, my co-author and I really want to explore more. And um, There's a really interesting book by Dave Grossman um, about the willingness to kill. And in it, he makes an assertion that most people who go on the battlefield don't actually fire. And that's for a series of reasons, but as human beings, we we don't want to kill each other. And the more kind of personal that relationship gets, like the closer I have to be to kill you, the less likely I am to actually do it. So if that's true, if this is like a distance problem, then according to that theory, the further you are away from the battle, the more likely you're going to be to pull the trigger because you don't have that same human connection. But what's different now is that the imagery that these pilots are looking at is actually kind of <coughs> more, um, less abstract and, and more um, concrete than, for example, if you're flying in the theater um, and you're maybe you know 20,000 feet up and you have a targeting pod, that targeting pod doesn't have what's called nears, which is like a, an imagery resolution. It may not have the same imagery resolution as some of the unmanned systems with the guy who's sitting you know, thousands and thousands of miles away. So the question is, does the imagery actually make that individual that's sitting thousands of miles away from the battlefield um, have the same emotional connection? Does that actually decrease their willingness to kill? And there's some evidence suggesting that this is definitely happening, right? There's um, been a lot of work on the post-traumatic stress disorder that's happening within our RPA community, the remote pi remotely piloted aircraft communities. So there's definitely some sort of emotional response that they're having. Um, and the question is, is, is that going to negate kind of this Dave Grossman theory that, that the further away you are, the more likely you are to be willing to kill? But there's also some thought that these, these pilots, these drone pilots are sitting there watching a target. You sort of begin to see, uh, particularly when you think about high value extremists that, that they're targeting, that, that, that they basically get to know these yeah, people. Like if they're watching a the compound, yeah. They're getting to see who comes when the yeah. children come to visit, and they get to actually know yeah. these uh, these the, the people that they're watching uh, before they actually pull the trigger, as it were. Yeah. On the other hand, these pilots go home to their families and their you know their lives at the yeah. end of their shift. You know, and, they're and, not and going back to 
their base or flying back to their aircraft so carrier. So there's not or this emotional separation either. And I mean, I would think. You, and the shift work. And I mean, tons of studies are coming out to say how bad shift work is for your emotional and physical well-being. Mm -hmm. So if you're constantly, you know, on it in the evening and you're switching over, I mean, this has got to cause a toll as well. well so are, are the mental health needs of, of these people being addressed in, in the military? This, this yeah. sounds like, you know, you yeah. might need to talk to a therapist. I'm not an expert on this. Yeah. Um, but there are people who are an ex experts on this and they are very concerned that First off, I mean, in a very like pragmatic way, they're not getting the retention that they want from these highly ah. skilled operators. Um, but and that could be a factor. They've just it like could be enough a factor. can't do it. And um, so I think there are. I think some people have identified that a problem exists, and I think theoretically there are people working on it. But I'm not close enough to the situation okay. to know whether they've made progress or not. So you've done some. So we're we're talking here about the sort of the the American you know, uh, 10,000 miles away, watching the, the battle unfold on a battle screen. But you've also looked at the sort of the, what to expect of Americans in harm's way who are depending upon close air support from an, either an autonomous mm -hmm. system or a remotely piloted system. And whether or not these operators trust yeah. the, the technology, I guess, yeah. right? What, yeah. what have you found? So I want to caveat because this piece has actually has gotten quite a bit of attention and maybe um, spinned a little bit the wrong way. Um, this was a, a, a study that we conducted um, over a few year time period between 2014 and about 2015. And we had a snowball sample of approximately 500 uh, joint terminal attack controllers and joint fires observers. These are the individuals that call in airstrikes from the battlefield. And in the survey, we presented a series of different scenarios. And we said, in this scenario, would you prefer manned, unmanned, or no pressure? Before delivering the close air support. Exactly. Right. So one of the scenarios, for example, was a, um, what we call a danger close scenario. Danger close is when, um, when you drop that weapon, you are within very close proximity to friendlies. So it becomes a really difficult problem for collateral damage very risky. And we found that, um, especially in those scenarios, we would see that our, our JTACs had a preference over 90% preference for manned systems in those scenarios. And there's a very strong preference across all demographics. Um, and we also conducted interviews, and the interviews also suggested that there was a real trust problem. So in these 500 surveys and interviews, um, not once did the, the controllers refer to the pilot of the unmanned system of the RPA as a pilot or as a person. It was always kind of in the opposite. The machine, the robot, not human. And we'd say, and when this was interviews, we'd say, but you know this is a human being. And you know this person has supposed has the same training requirements as those that are flying the manned aircraft. And they say, yeah, and then they would revert to the same vocabulary. So I think it's actually, it's, it's a subconscious. And um, some of the critique I've <clears throat> received on this paper is that I may have made it seem like it was irrational. And I want to say, I, I don't think this is an irrational response. I think that it's, as human beings, we have to rely on emotions and biases in order to process high uncertainty and high risk situations. And in this case, we found that this was a, um, this was a preference that was remarkably consistent. Hmm. So now we're very interested to see, okay, it's been many years, it's been you know three years since we initially started that. Has that changed? And is this an engineering solution where I just make better unmanned systems? Is this a training solution? Is there no solution? And I think most people wouldn't agree with that. Um, but that's really interesting is understanding where it goes from, I have confidence that this machine can do this, but I don't trust it, <clears> to <throat> I have confidence and I trust that the machine, that I can delegate authority to the machine. So you co-authored with uh, Julia McDonald another paper called Presidential Risk Orientation and Force Employment Decisions. And that was in the Journal of Conflict Resolution. And it looked at how a commander in chief's personality affects his, at this point only his, yes. his decision to use manned or unmanned weaponry. Talk about that. I mean, what a fascinating study. Yeah, Julie and I were really interested in understanding the role that risk proclivities were playing in this, what seemed to be um, a, a increasingly popular foreign policy choice. So we looked at, um, we pulled, um, hundreds of pages of discussions of text of George Bush and Obama talking about manned and unmanned types of operations. And then we had a, a 
coding system called the um, Operational Code Analysis Verbs and Context System. You know. um, but it's kind <laughs> of like a, a way to quantify what is inherently qualitative. And what we found in there was that, um, so kind of surprisingly, um, Bush's risk proclivity changed over time. So he was very situationally driven, whereas Obama, um, this is kind of surprising, I think, to most people, Obama had a very fixed risk proclivity. He was very risk averse. And no matter how much we tried to disaggregate the data and find kind of, oh, at this point, maybe there's a change if we just put this data here and this data here, we could find no change. And um, we found that there was kind of a statistical correlation between those risk proclivities and their desire to use unmanned operations versus manned operations. So the more risk averse you were, the more likely you were to use unmanned operations over manned operations. Wow. Well, in the, in the couple minutes that we've got left, you know, you're an expert in cybersecurity. We have uh, the uh, director of the National Security Agency recently testifying before Congress that uh, Russia's efforts to attack the United States in the cyber realm and in the information realm has not abated. The director of Central Intelligence, uh, uh, excuse me, the director of National Intelligence, Dan Coats, uh, testified before the Senate uh, that Russia is attacking us right now. Um, from your perspective, how does this play out? Oh God, I'm so pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I recently went to this workshop and, and usually these cyber workshops are the sky is falling and I'm just like, yeah, okay, whatever. And, but this one, they said, the sky is falling because there's no more truth. And it was so frightening because when there's tons and tons of information, human beings have to use our own biases in order to process that information. And that's where this kind of information operations um, and the work that the Russians have been doing is so successful because it takes what people may kind of naturally believe and then exacerbates them because there's so much information, it's hard to process what is truth and what is not truth. And so because of that, um, I think we as a democracy have, especially American democracy, we have believed so much in this truth that information is good with a capital G and it creates democracy and it makes us better governed. governed. Um, and if we no longer believe that information is good with a capital G, it actually becomes existential to our society in a really very uncomfortable way. And so I think that we're at risk in the next election, but larger, we're kind of at risk for who we are as a society if we continue to be bombarded by what is truth and what isn't. We need to leave it at that sobering thought. <laughs> Jackie Schneider from the U.S. Naval War College, thank you so much thank for you. being with us. Uh, that's all the time we have this week, but if you want to know more about storing the public square, you can catch up with us on Facebook and Twitter, or visit us at PellCenter.org, where you can also watch previous episodes. He's Wayne, I'm Jim. We hope you'll join us again next week for more Storing the Public Square.